Hey friends, it's Lisa Mason Ziegler coming to you here for the Gardener's Workshop Live where I meet you every Friday at 6 p.m. Um, to do all kinds of different things. And today I have a great time planned out for us. We are actually gonna take a walk around the farm and we're gonna have a look at cover crops. I have some beautiful cover crops y'all for y'all to look at and we're gonna talk about them. We're also gonna be chit-chatting about some direct seed, cool flower tips, kind of the way I do it basically. And we're also gonna have a look at a brand new area um, that we're preparing to kind of become a native planting, um, kind of sheltered area. I think we're gonna have a fire pit or something there. Um, so literally, I haven't even seen today what has happened. I just got home from um, the warehouse and um, I got my notes here. And so I'm, I'm making all my announcements before we go marching outside. Um, and I also want to show y'all something. So last week, um, I showed a vase of some of those mini sunflowers. You know, we've sown a lot of sunflowers together, y'all. Speaking of that, and thank you, Robin, for reminding me, if you have taken any of our online courses, we'd love for you to comment and use in the little sunflower emoji. That just um, lets everybody else know that you're one of our students, and we just love seeing how many of you guys are on here. Um, so, you know, we've been planting these sunflowers every Friday together, and we've stopped stopped starting them now, but we still have them out on the farm growing. And kind of naturally what happens um, is as the day length gets shorter, things start happening. Like they don't get quite as tall and as big as honking as they normally do. Um, but we take full advantage of the many sunflowers, y'all. That's literally what our commercial customers would call them. And so I showed this vase last week of many sunflowers and it, I mean, it just got thousands of hits. And so I have myself another little mini bouquet and I just have to show you guys. So look at these little beauties. So you can kind of, so these two are kind of the biggish ones, right? But look at these guys. Look, this is the red and there's the old gold light. Um, and look at this amazing little picture. This was um, Suzanne's mother-in-law's. I got this when she, they were cleaning out their house. Um, but these little mini sunflowers are storming the market, y'all. I mean, people are just loving them up. I mean, look how little this little guy is. And of course, these are still opening. We cut them in, well, like this kind of like this in tight butter, actually even a little tighter than that. And some of these were obviously further along than the others. Um, but these guys are just, and that's the plum there. These guys are just absolutely beautiful. And I just can't tell you. Um, so this would be an equivalent of one of our little $20 bunches. Um, you know, normally this is our bouquet, one of our leftovers from today for our members only market. Um, and so people, we made some of these mini sunflower bunches and they're gone. So I guess somebody took them. You know, people can come and pick theirs up and pick from um, the mix, all the mixed ones. So uh, the other thing I wanted to tell you because folks, there are so many questions coming in about cool flowers and we have some great companion resources for you guys. Uh, I put the link at the head of this feed for you to request. It's called All Things Cool Flowers and it's got as all of the links directly to all the different resources. And that way you'll have them all in one place. You should bookmark it when you get your email um, and just have access to all of that stuff because I've pretty much talked about everything over and over in different ways and in different formats. And so you can listen to podcasts, you can read articles, um, watch videos, there's all different kinds of stuff. So I wanna take us outside and I'm actually gonna take us on this tripod that you know I'm not really a very big fan of. It's not very um, user friendly. So what's gonna happen is I'm gonna take us outside and um, I'm gonna walk over to the side of the farm where that wonderful little building is called the Inn and look at some amazing um, buckwheat 
that's got some winter rye growing under it. And we're also going to look at a, a bed that's a mess. And it's a reseeded bed. And this is why I cannot rely on reseeding. So we'll go out there and have a look at it. And y'all, I had my um, coat on when I came out here because it's actually a bit nippy outside. But when I came in this building, um, it's not so nippy. So let me put this back on so that I do not have to feel like I need to. So y'all, let's just walk outside. Bear with me as I take you guys on a little walk about here. I don't wanna undo the tripod because then I'll have trouble getting it back together. So we are actually just gonna, if, so if for any reason the Wi-Fi goes wonky, just hang on, it'll come back as I move from one access point to another. All right, getting back here in the shade. I'm gonna have to make this a little shorter. Y'all are way up high. All right, so back here is um, one of the gardens and we'll go over here. My neighbor's mowing, but I think I can talk so y'all can hear. Um, and the sun is setting to the left of me here in the west. Here we go. All right, so let's take a look first. Look at this beautiful bed or garden. So this garden, y'all actually, um, I actually planted these seeds um, using our seed spreader. I actually did this on Facebook Live, right? I don't know if you were here. I'm trying to find a flat spot, y'all, to put y'all down. Um, that's not good. So I tried an experiment this year and it didn't necessarily work as wonderfully as I really wanted it to. So it was a little bit early, I felt like, to plant winter cereal rye, which is what I wanted to plant back here. Winter cereal rye is a cover crop you would never plant unless you have a tractor or some way to extinguish it because it has some pretty aggressive roots. So it was like, all right, it's almost a little too early to do that, it's still kind of warm. So I'm gonna mix the buckwheat seed with the winter cereal rye. And, and y'all, it just kind of worked kind of perfectly. So I'm gonna just kind of bend y'all over a little bit here. You can see there's the winter rye down there. So this buckwheat is now blooming and I'm realizing the error of my ways now because this was a little earlier Really, this buckwheat is at the stage right now where it should be incorporated to prevent it from reseeding. But I can't do that because the winter rye is underneath there. So I've just decided to, you know, live through my, my mistake. Um, but if I, and I do have another bed that you're gonna see in a different stage, much early, younger buckwheat, that it may work out because that buckwheat I don't think will be able to bloom before it gets cold enough that it's gonna kind of stop it from growing. So this will stay just like this. The buckwheat will get winter killed and the winter rye will just step up and take over the show. Now I'm gonna show y'all mess. Cause you know, we all have messes. Whether people wanna show them or not, we've all got it. So this bed right here, right here is a bed that totally reseeded itself heavily in Celosias. And we thought it was a really good idea because we had nothing that needed to be planted here just to let it go. And they were really useful. I will say they were really useful for several weeks for us to cut from, but because it reseeded, it wasn't in straight lines. Obviously the bed wasn't covered in mulch or any film. That's why it reseeded. Um, we weren't able to really hoe it. And if we don't do a lot of hand weeding around here, we use our stand up hoe and that's pretty much the extent of it. So it has now grown into a weedy mess. Um, this will get mowed now and I'm not sure what I'm gonna do with it. If I can mow it down close enough, then I might tarp it for the winter. Um, but I wanted to really put, I might put winter rye in here. The one reason that I love using winter rye is that winter rye um, winter cereal rye is allopathic. That means that um, it has got a natural 
herbicide or pre-emergent um, occurring at when you follow that crop with any direct seeded anything or weed seeds they don't germinate so you would never plant winter rye and then expect to direct seed something afterwards um, so we get really excellent weed control following a crop of winter rye but of course this winter rye will be here until next june so you don't ever plant it where you need the space in spring right this would be a great place to plant um like corn next year or beans or just any summer annual flower crop um, so I'm gonna take us back here I'm gonna so when I walk past this is the back of my building that we are always inside of and when I walk from where I am to over there we pass from one access point to another and they're still working on tweaking that so if I lose you just stand by for a minute and I will be right back so now we're gonna walk to the other side of the farm so the sun's not blinding you and me. I lost you there for a minute, sorry. Um, so this area has really been just on its own and we finally had to mow it and get the soil ready. And wait a minute, let me get out of this sun here, y'all, and I'll start talking again. I can't even see what you're seeing. So just to give you, this is that Rudbeckia native border here on my left. And let's just go back here and we'll start looking back the other way so the sun will be out of all of our eyes. Sorry, gang. All right, now, so let's turn around. All right, so there's our equipment shed. Um, and this entire area that you see is open soil um, was full of, I don't know if anybody recognizes, this is dog fennel, which is, you know, a native here in Virginia, but it is pretty aggressive and pretty invasive, and it just really took over back here, and I really shouldn't have let that happen anyway, and it wasn't even really very inviting for creatures because it was so thick, you couldn't even, I mean, it was just really, really thick, so back here we're preparing there'll be um four native trees planted back here some native shrubs and then we'll have a i don't know if it'll be a fire pit or a seating area there um, but the bird action back here y'all because look at all this this is all my native border that we've been planting over the last four years since we lost the farm um, and with the native border here in front of me which we will go in here with a spade and dig out these like saplings and um, the dog fennel that's reseeded in here. We also have invasive tansy. Nobody should plant tansy. It really is a great cut flower, but I'm telling you, it'll pop up about four years after you plant it. It will be everywhere and um, it's really moving into our Rudbeckia patch here. Um, so this patch is about 20 foot wide and it's about 90 feet long. It has solidago, which is goldenrod. That's a great native. We have Joe pie weed, tons of triloba, which is the black eyed Susan. That's the little teeny, it's only about that big, but it's a spray. Um, this is tons of bouquet making material in here, but it's also a really a big source of our native bees as well as lots of birds hang out in here so y'all I have to stand back to let y'all see what we're looking at here I'll go on this side so you can really see what we got going here so look at that I'm gonna put this down and I'm gonna go over here and stand so you guys can see just how tall this is So that is what is called sun hemp, S-U-N-N -N, hemp. This is not the hemp that everybody's growing for other reasons. Um, this is a summer, oh, and there's a hummingbird right there, y'all. Oh, he's right over here on our salvia. You can't see him because it's too dark. 
he just moved on. Anyway, we have so many hummingbirds here. Um, so this is a warm season tender legume, just like clover, how it feeds the soil nitrogen. Um, not to mention, think of the masses of organic matter that is gonna add. Um, so that is something we're experimenting with. This is another one. I would never dream of growing it unless you have a tractor to be able to extinguish it someplace. So, hey, I see so many of our students. Remember, if you're taking any of our online courses, we want you to um, comment with the sunflower that just identifies you to us and everybody that you're one of our students of any of our online courses. And we're so happy to have you here. So this area right now that we're looking at, right here, is exactly the same as the one we just saw over there that's blooming, except this was just planted about 10 days ago. So this one, you can really see, you can see that the rye is really hard to see because it's kind of a purpley stem when it first emerges. So the bigger stuff is buckwheat and then there's clover. And so this is another area that we're just gonna leave. Um, we're just gonna leave it here um, until probably next June when it's time um, to extinguish it. And somebody just asked, what does that mean? Extinguish means to end it, to stop it. So the only purpose that you grow a cover crop is for a purpose, whether it's for any or all of these reasons weed suppression, to add nitrogen back to the soil, to add tons of organic matter back into the soil. Um, but to be able to do all the benefits of a cover crop, you have to end the cover crop. Um, that can happen through incorporation via tilling, plowing, um, mowing it, turning it under. Some people you can even crimp. If you have the proper tools, you can crimp a crop and that would kill it and it lays it down and you can plant through it. There are endless ways to do it. But the problem that I find with, and, and, and um, cover crop is not necessarily the best thing for a novice, new grower to really try to embrace completely because it takes time to figure this out. I didn't do cover cropping for quite a few years. Um, and when we were in high production, we didn't use any cover cropping because we used every square inch of garden for production but we added lots of compost and we, of course we use organic fertilizers. Um, but if you don't extinguish a crop in any way that you choose to do that, and you can also just pull a tarp over it in the middle of summer and that'll often kill it too. Um, if you don't extinguish a crop at its prime um, stage, when it's the most fleshy and before it's gone to seed, then that's when people get into trouble and that's why some people just really don't like cover crops. It's because they've waited too late and instead of having this nice fleshy plant to mow and turn under or to cover with a car tarp or whatever you do, they now have a plant that has a woody stem that's also producing seed and so it's reseeding and becoming a weed in your garden. See what I mean? So it's like, it's all about timing folks, just like so often that is. The other thing I wanted to show you, and then we're gonna get over here. Well, we got another cover crop to look at. Um, look at this. This, remember all those salvia cuttings that we rooted all summer? Here they are. Um, so the green, the green is the salvia mexicana, and I'm sorry, Yes, the green is the salvia mexicana. That's what this is right here. And the purple is salvia leucanthia. And um, these are what we call, what I refer to as a half hardy perennial. That means that it sometimes survives our winter. It just really depends on how cold our winter gets. If we go down to single digits and it's not protected, like mulched in really well, um, then it's gonna die. So we always save a mother plant and that's what we cut cuttings from all, I think it was May and June back in our Facebook Live. So you can go back there. If you're one of our students, you can just look in my course, um, but everybody else, um, you can go back and look at the Facebook Lives. Um, and I don't know if you all can see them, but this is loaded with bumblebees, which of course are native bees. And this is a great late summer bloom for them. 
Um, and this is actually, I'm gonna find one here. Um, this, per, this green one, we really love green. And what'll happen if you wait and see this is, I would probably cut this one on Monday. Um, you wanna cut it long before that little purple thing jumps out of the middle, the little bloom in the middle hits. Because let me tell you, that little purple bloom that comes from within this green bud um, doesn't last very long and it drops that purple bud and it dries up and it looks just like rat poop. I'm not kidding you, I had this happen. And we had a customer that had bought a bunch of it, did huge arrangements, um, and they sat on it probably for a week before they used it. And then it dropped all those little buds, they dried up overnight, and when they came in the next morning, they were sure that there was a rat in there and it wasn't a rat at all. It was just salvia poop. <laughs> So that's why you have to be really sure, y'all, about the harvesting stage for the flowers you grow. So let's look at this. So this is another cover crop um, experiment that's going really well. So this is crimson clover. Let me bend you down here so you can see. This is crimson clover with buckwheat. So this is the crimson clover and this is the buckwheat. And again, it was kind of warm, so I decided to mix the two together so we would get instant sprouting and coverage from the buckwheat to make this canopy that you're seeing that really does an excellent job of weed suppression. Um, and the buckwheat's gonna get killed with the first frost, but that clover is gonna kick in and be just absolutely beautiful. So I wanna um, just move over here. So this is where our cool flower gardens are gonna be um, this year. They haven't been here for several years. Um, and this garden's in raw form. I mean, we haven't done anything yet to get ready because it's still a little, we're getting to the point now where it can happen. Um, so I was gonna turn this. Let me just turn y'all a little bit. Unfortunately, we have a very vocal neighbor dog Oops, sorry, that was a little much, wasn't it? So we just, this area that you see right here is probably where the direct seeded beds are gonna be. That vegetation you see growing is better known as weeds. Um, this has been bare soil now for about 10 days and you can see how quickly um, weeds jump up and we've already put down our fertilizer. Um, and then all these beds over here to the right which are just leftover weedy messes of zinnias and celosias and gumphrena um, for us to squeak out the last few bouquets that we need. Um, because in fact, y'all, guess what? Next week is our last, it's our farewell season. This is of selling flowers. We're still growing flowers. We're just not um, obligated to our 150 or 200 member, whatever it is, um, garden share program and subscriptions. Um, and so that just opens a lot of opportunity for us to do a lot more stuff like we're doing here right now, right? So we are just waiting now for next week's harvest to happen. And then a, most of the rest of this garden is coming out. So what's gonna happen here, because this garden doesn't have mature vegetation growing in it, this is gonna be where I potentially will plant, I think I have three beds of direct seeded cool flowers to plant, and the rest of the beds, which is six more, um, will be planted in cool flower transplants. Um, and you know, you always look, you know, you can look in the book to see which does the seed prefer, which is the easiest way probably one of the most common questions I get is my XYZ doesn't germinate inside. I'm having a terrible time. Well, it should be sown outside. And there's a lot of reasons why some seeds prefer that. One of the most common is it likes cool nights and warm days, and it's almost impossible to provide those conditions indoors. Um, but when you, um, but when you plant at the proper time in fall, like the Indian summer is what we're looking for, you know, 60 degree nights with days still warming up. It's the cool nights that really push the seeds um, to sprout and break dormancy. Um, and so anyway, this is where they're gonna be planted. And so I'm just gonna tell you in a nutshell what we do.
So we've already put our fertilizer down. So this area, this is not our no-till area. We've planted our cool flowers the last two years in the no-till area and we're move, we're just rotating now. Um, so we will make the beds with our tractor. Um, the direct seeded beds do not have film on them. Um, we will mulch the pathways um, with one, any very, uh, several different options. We have leaves, landscape cloth, um, well actually just those two. Um, I haven't decided what we're gonna do yet, but anyway, so the tops of the beds will be open, um, and typically when I sow cool flowers, direct seeding, um, I only put three rows in a bed. Our beds are always 30 inches wide because that is what um, our bed, our tractor makes. And so normally all of our other annuals typically are four rows to a bed. You know, we're all about intensive gardening here and farming, but for direct seeding management to prevent weeds, I have learned through years of struggling um, that only planting three rows um, evenly spread over that bed um, is the best way because that means that I can hoe weekly with our garden stand-up hoe. It's a trapezoid hoe that Elliot Coleman designed. We buy it, we get it from Switzerland. Um, makes it like a cup of tea. I mean, it takes me literally less than five minutes to hoe an 80 or 90 foot bed with three rows in it. Um, that's how we have no weeds in our direct seeding. Um, that's the number one complaint I hear from people and it's all about the way they set up their garden, the way that they plant their seeds, and then they don't hoe weekly. Um, and that weekly hoeing in the fall eliminates all of those cool season seeds like chickweed that just take over people's gardens come spring. So um, we'll make our beds I will plant my seeds once the nighttime temperatures are dropping into the 60s, but the days are still warm. Um, and if it doesn't rain, um, watering your direct seeded stuff will really speed up the um, germination. So you have to, we do not put irrigation down in our direct seeded beds because that would be a total mess trying to hoe. Um, so if we need to water, we use a, our garden hoe with a wand on it. And because as I, um, I think it's actually, there's a diagram in Cool Flowers, I believe, because I always plant seeds, um, first off, I only direct seed cool flowers. I don't do any direct seeding in the warm season. It is much too much of a struggle, weed pressure, heat, a whole lot of reasons. Um, so the only time we ever direct seed is this time of the year because the conditions are conducive to it. Um, but we plant in a little trough that I actually make by pulling the edge of my hoe, the point of the hoe, down to make a trough all along the bed. The bed's not made, obviously, here. Um, let's walk down here and you can actually see what a bed looks like ultimately, but this isn't the cool season beds. Um, these are the old cool season beds that are now in no-till and they have clover. We'll talk about this in a minute after I finish talking to you but so this is what one of our beds would look like like right here in front of you you can see a couple of different ways that we cover pathways that black landscape fabric is pathway there's the bed and there's a leafed pathway so I would use my hoe to pull three rows in there and then we literally sow the seeds in the bottom of those troughs. I sow the seeds. Yes, I sow by hand. Um, and I do, I mean, I used to do 30 direct seeded beds, 120 feet long. I mean, it's really a quite simple step. Um, you have to buy enough seeds and you have to know whether it gets covered with soil or not. That's key piece of information. Um, and then literally we hand water and um, you know, it really does great. So we normally don't cover any of our beds with hoops and row covers until we drop down into the mid 20s typically, um, because nothing that I grow, I only grow cool flowers that are winter hardy. I only plant in the fall cool flowers that are winter hardy here. I don't do any more of that heroic stuff, trying to get stuff to go through the season um, because we just can grow so many. We just don't do that anymore. Um, but once we drop down into really cold winter, I do hoop and cover all of our beds, mainly for wind protection to keep the deer from 
walking all over the beds and from rabbits from eating um, transplants, but um, don't put the row cover on too soon. And we always take the row cover down when snow is coming. So, um, you know, those are my best tips for direct seeding. And the most challenging thing that I think people face is they start too early, they plant seeds outside too early, still too warm, the seeds don't germinate, but the weed seeds do, they don't stay on top of hoeing weekly, it's very difficult while you're waiting for seeds to germinate, and some seeds are just slow. Larkspur can be really slow, Bupleurum can be slow. Um, and then blue plurum is really hard to see. Sometimes it's there and you're just not even seeing it because of the color and how thin the vegetation is. Um, and so I'll show you an experiment that I almost did a good job on. See all this green you're seeing? That is crimson clover that I sowed way too thickly. You know, we use a, um, our seed spreader and my theory was that we w I would use that and if it got in the pathway, that'd be fine. Clover can sprout there because we'll be beefing up all these pathways with tons of leaves as soon as that weather starts, right? Um, but our no-till area is getting this clover, and then we'll figure out how we're going to extinguish this when spring comes. This is where our summer annual garden is going to be next year. Um, and so that's really, really pretty exciting. Um, so my best advice to you, and I'm going to come over here and sit and then answer your questions. And I will answer your questions, so just post them in the comments. And I'll do my best to get to all of them. All right, let's see here. So that bed, maybe I won't sit here, y'all. These dogs don't stop barking. Um, so this bed right here is the beginning of cool flowers. Everything from there over will be um, made into new beds um, and fertilizer has already been added and um, everything from here over will be warm season next year. All right, guys, let's see if y'all got any questions. It's so nice to see so many students on here. Hello, Australia. Yeah, crimson clover is really beautiful, too. And, you know, I don't mind that the deer and rabbit chew on it. You know, everybody needs food, right? Um, and so we have a lot of deer action over here on it. Um, and we got peak folks from all over, including Australia. All right, I know I saw some questions. Oh, my goodness, Wanda had her first snow today. Wanda is in Alaska and grows tons of peonies up there. And, um, all right, y'all, I'm looking for my question here. So it's really nice out here. It's nice, cool weather. Kathy, if seeded cool flowers are submerged underwater for a day or two, do you think they will survive? They were just nicely emerging in rows. You know, Kathy, I am so sorry. I did see the pictures from Janice on that. And I will tell you from unfortunate past experience, I have had them survive. Um, you know, when you get those deluges of rain that it doesn't matter how well you drain, it still can't get away fast enough. I mean, if it, if the, if they weren't submerged for days, um, you know, I think you have a good chance. I think it's definitely worth thinking about. And I tell you, that's what makes me build my, especially cool flowers. Um, that are going through the winter, even areas that you think aren't a drainage problem can be a drainage problem in the winter because everything's different in the winter, y'all. The soil's cold, the air temperature's cold, nothing dries out. Rain, snow comes, and ice, and when it melts, it just doesn't go anywhere. It just sits, and um, so I'm really sorry about that, Kathy. I really can't say what it'll do, but I've got my fingers crossed for you guys, and, you know, I know that Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't just replant, you know, somewhere else, and maybe you'll get twice as much stuff, you know. Um, but I have been there. I actually, when Janice sent me the pictures, Janice is Kathy's daughter, and she is Harris Flower Farm in Canada, and, and they have a pretty big operation. And they've just been submerged in water for days, just rain and rain. Um, and 
I remember when we had water right here in front of me over all the tops of our beds. Um, it was bad. So Kathy says she bought two of the salvia plants to overwinter, and that's what we do. We just have mother plants, and we, um, we keep them. He doesn't see me. Let me just stand up. Steve's waiting to see if the dog's loose. All right, friends, it looks like we don't have any quail. Wait, what will you do with all the flowers you grow when you're no longer selling bouquets? Oh, Linda, we have so many little projects and we have, we have lots of places for our, we do a lot of gifting of flowers already. And um, see, we won't be obligated to grow such volume that we have been for all these years because we're obligated to people for bouquets. And so it'll just change everything. And Connie, I'm taking your course this fall. Welcome aboard. And we'll be starting my flower farm next year. We will not be moving to our property until January and I'm in zone 8A. Needless to say, I won't be able to do the fall planting of cool flowers this year. Am I still gonna be able to grow cool flowers in my zone in the spring? The problem, you're in the same zone as me, by the way. Um, the problem that we face in our region is because we typically, I don't know exactly where you are, but we typically go from the cold of winter and rush through spring and then we're into the heat of summer. We don't really have a very long spring. So sometimes um, fall, very early spring planted cool flowers, which if you're like me, my first, my last frost date is mid-April. Um, so that means that we plant very early spring would be mid-February and we plant a lot of stuff then. There's a lot of things you can plant. Um, you know, we plant straw flowers then and stock and more sweet William and um, lots of different things, but what I just want you to be aware of is that there are many things you can pretty much, like me, plant almost everything in the fall. If your very early spring planted crops are not as wonderful as you anticipated, it's the timing of the planting. They may do great, but I'm just saying they may not be as abundant, as tall, and as disease and pest resistant, and to go into summer with such a armor on that they survive, you know, into the heat. Um, so we have really good luck. Certainly you should grow straw flowers. Um, snaps are so-so. They just don't say, they seem to fall victim to disease pretty quickly. Don't even think about Bells of Ireland in the spring. Um, but there, I would try a lot, mostly, mostly the stuff that you can transplant. Just because you have to plant so early in the garden, and it's usually not warm enough to sprout seeds, but certainly experiment, give it a try and see. Janet, will I be able to direct sow cool season springs in the annuals in early spring? Um, so what I was just kind of saying with um, Connie's question is that the problem with direct sowing in the very early spring, think about it, eight weeks before your last spring frost, what is it we're waiting for in the fall for great germination out in the garden? We're looking at 60 degree nights and 70 degree days. Well, you're not gonna be getting that in very early spring. Um, so I have heard all kinds of crazy things that people have done um, to get some of those best direct seeded seeds or easiest direct seeded seeds to germinate indoors. I've also heard things of people talking about sprinkling. I learned this when I was up in the north lecturing um, that a lot of times they sprinkle these direct seeded seeds into the snow and they get watered as they melt. You know, how good do they germinate? It's hard to say. Um, so you'll have to really experiment, Janet. Um, but that's the problem. There's no heat. And by the time the heat comes, you've missed that window. You know what I mean? They should have already been established and getting ready to grow, not just germinating. So I'm not gonna tell anybody not to do anything, but just don't be surprised if you don't get a great performance. Oh, thank you, Claire. I do love that hoe. I direct seeded my cool flowers today. Should I cover them with a floating row cover? Well, Kay, it really depends on your conditions. Um, I would say that um, we only cover early if we have varmint troubles. I mean, if birds are coming to eat your seeds, 
Um, you just don't want to heat them up any more than the weather is. But if you're already cold, by all means, put a row cover on. It shouldn't be necessary. It does help retain moisture. Um, so if I would put a row cover down, it would definitely be hooped and covered, not just laid right on them because that might really dry them out if the sun, if it's sunshiny and bright there. Hope that helps you. How do you battle, oh gosh, weeds that has rhizomes. I can't say the word that she typed here. Um, and I tell you the truth that all the plants, whether it's considered a weed or not, that spread um, are very difficult to battle. A lot of times smothering them, you know, putting tarps over them for long periods of time. I mean, I'm talking a whole season perhaps um, that's the only way that it just they just literally wear themselves out and die trying to grow and spread and not getting any light not getting any water um, if i understand your question what are you fertilizing with um you can find it on our website it's a dry organic um, certified chicken litter based fertilizer it's really easy to put down it's like little pellety things um, it's slow release as most organic fertilizers are um, and we love it I've used it for years and years and we now um, have it available for folks to buy got here late I just direct seeded my cool flowers seeds in 8a in an area that does not have much sunlight mm, with the seedling will the seedlings health be dependent on light well for sure I mean most cool flowers are full sun um, and um, you'll just have to see how it goes, I guess. I guess you're planning on growing them there. Um, that just presents, having low light just presents a lot of challenges um, that, you know, that you may or may not experience. Lori, cannot wait for the class this fall. Yeah, can you believe that our regular enrollment starts October 1st through 5th. Oh my gosh, y'all, I just can't even believe it's that soon. And then a month later, school starts. I'm totally stoked about it. Really excited um, for everybody that's um, signed up and that is gonna sign up. So friends, I am gonna get off here. I hit the wrong button. Um, I'm really glad everybody joined. Remember, if you wanna get that document, All Things Cool Flowers, which has all the links um, to everything that I've done for Cool Flowers. You know, all the free webinars, the book study, all of that good stuff. So friends, I um, feel like there's something else I wanted to tell you, but I'll catch you next time. So see you on Wednesday on Instagram for Ask a Flower Farmer at 1130, and then over on Clubhouse at one o'clock um, and we have a lot of great discussions going on. So, friends, um, glad you joined me. Until we meet again, ciao.